Welcome to Happy Homes and Gardens. I'm your host. My name is Daphne Royce. I am a real estate broker, architecture, and interior designer. The climate has changed dramatically around the world in the recent years. California has increased wildfire danger, extreme drought conditions, rising temperatures. Dr. Clements is professor and chair in the Department of Meteorology and Climate Science at San Jose State University. He is also the director of the National Science Foundation Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. Welcome, Dr. Clements, who will share information regarding fire risk and fire prevention with us. Good morning, Dr. Clements. Good morning, Daphne. Thanks for having me. Tell us about you and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a professor of meteorology, and uh, I study fire weather and fire behavior and fire danger. And I've been at San Jose State since 2007, where I also teach classes in meteorology, climate change, instrumentation, and uh, wildfire science. So what is the relationship between wildfire and climate change? Well, as we see more and more, wildfires are getting more severe and more frequent around the Western U.S. And then particularly in California, it's you know something that we just have to deal with more and more uh, as our summers uh, get hotter and hotter. And so what we found and what the scientific community has found is that as climate change is occurring, the world, the northern hemisphere and uh, most of the planet has warmed a degree Celsius over the last 40, 50 years. And so what that's done is changed weather patterns and it's caused um, our summers to get warmer, which then leads to drying. And so if we dry out the atmosphere, you're drying out the, the vegetation. And so the vegetation becomes more easily burnable when it's drier. And so we're seeing a link between climate change and fire intensity and, and large fire growth and, and fire uh, frequency. You just mentioned that Earth's temperature rises about one degree. It is such a small change. What is so significant? Well, one degree Celsius, it seems small, but on a global level, there are some areas that are increased uh, more than that, and some areas have increased less than that. And what that does, that just puts a perturbation into the the climate system. And so as we warm up, we have um, different areas that get warmer and less cold. And so that shifts some of the weather patterns. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing heat waves in Europe. We're seeing ground uh, uh, um, record-breaking uh, heat in, in London and England. And um, also in the Southern Hemisphere as well, in Australia. So we're seeing all these um, repercussions playing out. And this was predicted in climate models uh, decades ago. You know, we climate scientists and the climate science community has been warning that we're going to get warmer and warmer, hotter and hotter summers. And it's playing out before our very eyes. So what is a fire science and what tool do you use to study wildfires? Yeah, so generally fire science can be broken into a couple of different uh, fields. So there's like fire protection engineering, and that is uh, an in a subdiscipline of engineering that studies like fire safety and, and building codes and how houses can be safe from uh, electrical fires or also fire uh, wildfires. So there's like the fire safety uh, side of things. And then there is the um, like fire ecology and wildfire science, which includes meteorology, ecology, um, social science and engineering and looking at kind of the dy dynamics of fire spread and fire behavior. Uh, so when we think of fire science, some people might think of the engineering side of looking at how fire safety in buildings. And then there's the wildfire science or the wildland fire side that looks at like the ecology and how fire spread on uh on the ground. I'm sorry, I don't understand ecology very well, but is that something to do with the ecosystem? Yeah, so uh, much of the ecosystems that are fire prone, they're fire adapted. And so certain plants grow in certain areas because of 
uh, the amount of fire that is on the landscape. And some landscapes require fire. Most of the Western US requires fire to be on the ground occasionally. But what we're seeing now because of climate change and, and some po forest policy as well, where we had reduced fire um, or increased fire suppression over the last hundred years. So we've had a buildup of fuels or buildup of vegetation in the forests. Climate change has caused those fuels to be drier. And so then we have more intense fires because we have a lot of stuff that's easier to burn. Um, so fire ecology plays a big role in fire science. We try to understand how what ecosystems need uh, the frequency of fire in those systems and, and what plants have adapted to those types of ecosystems. And so we usually generally can consider the fire adapted communities or fire adapted um, uh, ecosystems. For all the changes, would you have any suggestions about the landscaping near homes that we can maybe modify or change? Yeah, generally, uh, if you're in a fire prone area, um, there's a couple of different things. One's called defending or maintaining defensible space, because if your house is just covered with vegetation, with lots of plants around it and overhanging trees, it's very difficult for firefighters to get to your property and defend that house. So what homeowners can do is they can actually clear the property. You know, you are going to keep your trees, but you're going to trim them up from the ground. You're going to remove uh, vegetation from around the house. And so there's different zones around the property and generally we call that defensible space. And so basically within five feet of the home, you want to maintain non-combustible uh, material. So uh, that's just basically around the house. Now, a lot of people like plants and flowers around the house, but if you can, you want to remove everything if you're in a very high fire danger zone and uh, use materials such as rock, stone or gravel around that area or pavers. Um, you don't want tree branches extending into this space. Um, the next zone would be from that zone, like five feet from your house property or perimeter to 30 feet. And that you also want to employ non-combustionable landscaping. Uh, you want to remove ex uh, vegetation. You can leave plants in uh, place, obviously, but you want to keep them trimmed and you want to reduce uh, uh, any large areas that could um, be combustible, such as sheds and um, other things. Um, one thing that um, people really should consider is their rooftop. And we'll talk, we can talk about the materials later, but you have to keep your roof and gutters clean if you have overhanging trees. That's one thing that we saw in a lot of these um, big fires like the campfire, the, the eaves and the gutters were filled up with pine needles so that when embers fell on the roof, even though the roof was fireproof or wasn't combustible, made out of the you know approved material, it's the house caught on fire because there was a lot of dead needles on the roof. So keeping your rooftops clean as well. Um, another thing about in that uh, intermediate zone out to thirty feet is you want to um, uh, keep uh, the canopies of the trees, the branches. You want to trim them up at least ten feet away from the structure. And, and maybe keep those trees 18 feet or so apart so they can't ignite one of another, each other. So, you know, you want to space the vegetation out as much as possible, but you still want to maintain shade on your property and, and beautiful trees. So it's kind of something that you just have to think about, like, well, I can remove that tree, I can trim these shrubs, I can clear everything around the house, but I want to maintain these larger trees here so you can keep them trimmed up. Uh, and then further, if we think about out to 100 feet, which is, you know, the you know, our defensible space goes out to 100 feet around the property. Um, that's where you want to remove excess vegetation. And you only want to place, have plants that are, um, uh, have a reduced in fire ignition. So maybe some native plants or something. Um, you also want to use low fire risk ground covers in that area. And you want to make sure those canopies of the mature trees um, should be uh, at least 12 feet apart because that's kind of farther distance away from the home. So there's some basic rules called FireWise. And you can Google FireWise communities or FireWise defensible space, and it comes up with lots of different um, graphics that should be very uh, uh, easy to see. So another thing is 
basically you want to have your driveway accessible with a, 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 the address visible because firefighters want to be able to get access to your house. If you have low overhanging trees on your driveway, it may be very difficult for an engine to get in there. And if they can't get in there, then they're going to drive to the next home that's defendable. So you need to make your house defendable. Uh, if you have storage sheds or um, wood piles or fuel tanks, you want to keep those at, you know, out past 30 feet from the home. Um, you want to have a 10, at least 10, 100 feet of garden hose attached to the house. So in case you are there and you can actually access, uh, put out spot fires if there's fires around the property. And you also want to maintain a chimney that's uh, screened and clean. So you don't actually use your chimney and start a fire on your roof or on your own property. So thinning and pruning trees around your house is really important and trying to maintain um, a five foot um, buffer against the actual perimeter of the home. So those are the kind of things you can do with the landscape. And there's, uh, again, if you go to um, firewise.org, that's a, a national website that gives you all these tips and, and some other uh, tips to, to use around the house. So what is the best time for homeowners to start to prepare for their landscapings? Generally, any time, but usually in winter, you want to make sure, you know, if you do this once, then you just maintain the property. So, you know, as you do your uh, landscape maintenance, so it's pretty, but it, if you don't have um, a firewise landscaping around your home right now, the sooner the better you can do it. And getting a crew in there to trim the trees, remove any kind of vegetation that needs to be removed. Um, and that's uh, something that you can do anytime. But generally, once that's done, then you just maintain it like you would a regular yard. Can you talk about the normal historical fire seasons in California and what is now? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of discussion in the science community or wildfire science community that, you know, fire seasons, there is no more fire season because we have fires all year round. And that's partly true, but we do have a fire season in Northern Cal in California, depending on the winter. If we have a wet winter, that really offsets the early fires that we can get. Um, we, are, we are seeing that the fall is extending later and later. So we're not getting our normal fall precipitation or rain. And so if we don't get our rain in October, which is typically our climatological norm, then we can get big fires in October and even in November, like the campfire in 2018. So our fire seasons are kind of extending, but it also depends on the uh, previous winter's precipitation. So if we have a wet winter, we might have a more normal fire season. If we have a dry winter, we can have an earlier and maybe even a later fire, extended fire season. So Fire season is a dynamic term these days because it just depends on the previous weather or or what's going to happen in this fall. Like if we get a cool season, you know, this fall here in California, if we get a uh, early rain, that can really help us um, shut down our fire season. But if we don't, which is what's been happening the last few years, we could see uh, an extended fire season through November again. We had a recent fire since 2017, 2018. I know the community slowly tried to rebuild areas. Do you have uh, any suggestion on the building materials? Is more resist to fire? Yeah, well, there's um, some basic, uh, basic guidelines and there are some rules that you can't, you know, you have to have uh, making sure your roof is fire rated is a very important step. So most asphalt shingles on the market are considered class A fire rated. So they're fire resist, highly fire resistant as are concrete and clay. So you, you know, uh, wooden shingles are no longer, uh, you know, allowed. And so if you rebuild, you're gonna have modern shingles. Um, you know, and if you make improvements to, um, and there, there are some other materials that are on the, coming on the market and um, you can research those. Uh, for walls and such. But in California, we have to have wood structure homes because of earthquake. And so you can get um, 
different types of siding that are more fire resistant and you can get different vents you know you have to have your uh, eaves vented so you can get uh, vents that are won't allow embers to actually enter into the home because a lot of fires actually a lot of houses burn down when the a small ember gets up into the crawl space or the attic of the home and so having um vents that are allow the airflow but not embers to travel through are are a good choice and those are available now and i don't know the model numbers or the manufacturing numbers but you can look those up um and and when you do make improvements to your home if it's an existing home you should uh contact your insurance agent because that could help um lower your premium as everything that you do if you re, you know do the defensible space around your house if you uh upgrade the vents on your uh, eaves and such, then you can actually um, potentially lower your premium. I am a real estate professional and often see homeowners obtain homeowner policies. Most people just pay their premiums, do not carefully review their policies. From your point of view, how often should homeowners revisit their insurance for the proper coverage? And how about renters? Do you have any input on this? Yeah, well, I know I, I talk a lot with the insurance industry. And um, so basically, uh, damage caused by fire and smoke. You know, some people forget about smoke. Even if your house is not damaged by the fire, you could have smoke impacts. And there's a lot of um, claims based just on smoke damage because it can be so dense on these in these regions, even though your house, the fire is far away from your house and doesn't burn your house, you can get a lot of smoke damage in your house. And uh, damage caused by both fire and smoke are covered under uh, standard homeowners and renters insurance policies. Um, a standard homeowners insurance policy covers wildfire caused property damage to a home structure and its outbuildings like the garage or sheds or such, as well as personal belongings in the house. Um, a renter's insurance policy covers the renter's personal belongings. So uh, in addition, a water damage caused by uh, the firefighters extinguishing the fire is covered under both the homeowner's and renter's insurance policies. So, you know, definitely you should look into this and review your policy if you have to update it every year, but make sure that it uh, covers all these different things. Um, yeah, so standard homeowner's and renter's insurance policies also provide what's called additional living expenses. And so, that allows you, if you have to be relocated to during a mandatory evacuation, that you could get those co costs covered. Um, and so, yeah, there, I would check in with your insurance agent and make sure that all this is in your policy. Could you talk about evacuation and preparedness and what should people be focused on? Yeah, well, uh, you know, when when there is a fire evacuation, I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, have said, hey, we know we just we saw the fire and then we had to evacuate within, you know, a few minutes. And you should, if you live in a fire prone area, you should have a what's called a go bag. You should have extra medication in there, uh, your contact numbers for uh, family and friends. You should have uh, cell phone chargers. You should have um, water, bottled water, and maybe some power bars or some. Uh, snacks that you could just keep in a duffel bag or some sort of bag and um, you know your important documents that you may need your passport these kinds of things so during fire season if you need to there's an evacuation you're ready to go and you have everything in one location versus having to scramble through drawers and such to get those items so having that and then also <clears throat> uh, getting out as quick as possible um, and making sure that uh, you know the evacuation route. Generally, you'll be guided, but a lot of times it's smoky. And so you need to be able to get through the neighborhood and um, drive carefully to get to a safe location. Um, if you have multiple family members that live in the home, you might have um, uh, a place located somewhere, um, you know, in a safe location, well far away, that that's where we're going to meet. Or you know, that may not, you know, if the fire is really large, it may, that may not be possible. But these are some ideas. And again, if you go to firewise.org, they have a lot of these tips on their website. Do you have information about how people should deal with the smoke during a wildfire? Yeah. So if you're in an area, you know, the Bay Area, we've been kind of lucky this year so far. You know, we're entering August, which generally we'll, we should probably see some more larger fires burning and a lot more smoke impacts. 
if you're elderly or suffer from asthma or any other um, uh, respiratory illness, you, you should really stay indoors. You, uh, everybody's used to wearing masks now, so maybe get try to find a PM 2.5 mask or one of these um, higher quality masks for that we were used to using during COVID. And so wearing a mask, even indoors, if your house doesn't have a good filtration system or air conditioning system, uh, keeping your windows closed and just limiting exercise outside. And usually these episodes don't, la- depending on your location, uh, in the Bay Area, they don't last for more than a week or so. And then we get maybe some clean air coming in and then people can relax and then it might happen again. And it could be, it could change on a day to day basis. You could be really smoky in the morning and then it might be clear in the afternoon and then it might be smoky again at night. And that's just uh, a function of the local meteorology moving the smoke back and forth through the Bay Area. So being prepared with masks, being able to stay indoors, not exercising uh, outside. So Dr. Clemens, could you tell us what tool the scientists use to study wildfires? Yeah, well, uh, studying wildfires is uh, becoming more uh, popular in the scientific community with different fields in science addressing the problem in wildfire. There's a number of different tools that uh, different groups of scientists are using. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do here at San Jose State and what the general um, tools that folks use around the world. First thing is we want to understand the fire environment. So to do that, we use a lot of satellite technology. So there are sensors on satellites up in space that can sense the ground, they can sense the vegetation, uh, they can also spot and detect the fire. So satellite fire detection is very, very important and it's a it's a, a big tool that scientists use to understand how the fire, how fast it grew, uh, how it changed the landscape, what the vegetation looks like before and what it looks like after for some of these large fires, in addition to tracking the wildfire. Uh, the resolution of satellites is pretty coarse. So and, and some satellites are what are called geostationary versus polar orbiting. So polar orbiting satellites, they, they go around the Earth. So they're taking a like a movie of the as they go around a certain area. So they only get a snapshot at one time during the day or once or twice a day whereas a geostationary satellite is fixed in space and it's always looking at the earth at the same spot. So we get a, like a continuous uh, image of it. So these satellites, their resolutions are pretty low. So what we can also do and what scientists do, including San Jose State, is we have very fancy infrared cameras that we mount in aircraft. And um, in our application, we're trying to better understand fire behavior. So we're using a very high resolution, specialized imaging system that'll be mounted. It's mounted in the belly of an aircraft actually this summer that we're studying. We have a field project and I'll get into that in a little bit. But other agencies such as CAL FIRE and the Forest Service, they actually contract other companies to fly airplanes with cameras similar in technology to fly the perimeter of the fire so they know exactly what the fire has done every 24 hours. The problem with that is, is you get one snapshot, very high resolution, a snapshot once a day. And so you say, okay, they usually fly it at night and they fly from a high altitude and they get to see this image. And so they map the perimeter, but we don't know what happens between that perimeter and the next day. So we need better technology. And that's one of the things that we're doing at San Jose State is we're using a, this camera system on an aircraft to get better information during the course of how a fire is spreading so we understand the fire behavior. Other tools that we use are um, basically fire weather stations. So we use uh, surface stations. So these are weather stations that are placed all around the state, actually all around the world. But uh, California has the most surface weather station than any other region in the world because of the utilities. The utilities have very high risk for fire and so uh, they want to know the environment and the weather conditions at the surface so they can help manage their um, uh, infrastructure. And so we can use all these surface weather stations. One thing that's unique to San Jose State is we have a mobile Doppler radar. So that's a weather radar on a truck. And so we actually take that to wildfires and we can actually scan the fire from a safe distance. And the picture be, uh, behind my uh, image here. This is us at the Dixie fire, and you can see them move the other way. You can see the way radar scanning the fire as it's burning down the mountainside. This is from the Dixie fire last year, and so we can 
place the radar in a safe location. And the radar allows us to look at the winds inside the plume. And with those types of data, we can understand how the fire behaved, how the atmosphere responded, and what, what drove the fire spread. And those data are actually useful for another tool, which is called high resolution numerical modeling. So it's basically weather prediction that uh, incorporates a fire model and a weather model. And as you've heard, and what we've seen is that, you know, fires create their own weather. They put up big plumes, they create their own thunderstorms and big clouds, which then change the winds around the fire, making them, you know, much more uh, dangerous and less predictable. And so the modeling tools, the that we call them a coupled fire atmosphere model. It allows us to use a fire model, which generates the heat of the fire and the fire line and the spread of the fire and puts that heat into the weather model. And then the weather model responds by generating these fire induced or fire caused circulations. And so then we can model how the atmosphere and the fire are interacting over the terrain and through the canyons and through the vegetation. And so to understand if that model is doing really, really well, if it's accurate, we need to have satellite data, which we ingest into the model in real time. We need to have surface weather stations, which we ingest into the model to, to tune the, the weather prediction side of it. And we also have to have some of these um, profiles from the radar. And we have other techniques such as using drones to map vegetation. Uh, we have another uh, tool called Doppler LiDAR. It's actually like a radar, but it uses a laser beam. And it's also truck mounted and we take that to wildfires and we can measure the winds and we can measure the smoke layers and such with that. So that gives us an idea of what the winds are doing outside of the fire while the radar measures the winds inside the fire. So, you know, all these new tools are, uh, you know, basically have been um, the groundbreaking research here at San Jose State. And so we're, we kind of started this over a decade ago using these tools on active wildfires. And now we're um, integrating that into more of our modeling capability here as well. So the scientific community is building new tools and new sensor systems for aircraft, satellite, and, and such. And so in the next few years, we're going to see even better observations of the fire, of wildfire. And uh, that should help us with our modeling and prediction because fire modeling and fire wildfire prediction is just kind of, even though it's not in its infancy, it's been around there's newer technology that needs to be leveraged so we can get better predictions for saving lives and property in the future. So is it your tool study for wildfires and also this control burned wildfires? Yeah, we use these tools for also what we call prescribed fires because we need to put prescribed fire on the landscape. So prescribed fire is a purpose intensively intentionally set wildfire. It's not a wildfire. So a wildfire is a fire that's out of control. A prescribed fire is a fire that's been put on the landscape to manage the ecosystem, remove the dead fuels. And a lot of ecosystems need low intensity fire every few years to remove the fuels, clear out the, uh, um, the understory of the forest, and that helps us reduce fire risk in the future. So we actually use these modeling tools and the measuring tools to, to understand the environment when we do do prescribed fires. Uh, there's lots of prescribed fires going on around the Bay Area. Usually it's Cal Fire and the state parks that are managing those fires. And they only burn a few acres at a time, maybe up to 100 acres in the spring or winter. And so uh, that really helps reduce wildfire risk in the future. And we should really start to expect more prescribed fire because it's the only way to really do a large scale fuel reduction program in our forests. We can't we can't cut down all the trees. We can't remove all the brush. The best way to do is allow a fire to burn through the forest unpeated under the most right conditions. So it doesn't actually get out of control and become a wildfire, but it actually burns into something beneficial to the ecosystem. Do your information also work with the fire department to let people know when is the time to evacuate? We don't generally talk, we don't do evacuation. Um, information or uh, notifications. That's generally uh, an agency's responsibility, emergency management agency's responsibility. Uh, when there is a fire, we, we have a model, we run the model, it's on the website. So fire management agencies such as CAL FIRE and the U.S. Forest Service, 
uh, can access the model to look at where the smoke's going to go, where the fire's going to go, and you know the best case situations, or you know, you know, the mod all the models have uh, pros and cons, and so they use a number of different tools. Um, but then we also can deploy to wildfires to pro provide extra support. Um, a lot of times when we get asked to go to a fire, it's to help support smoke management because we have the tools that measure smoke up in the high atmosphere. Or it's also just to measure the winds above the ground so we can go and help uh, provide those data to the fire incident command team. And so uh, and then another time is when we actually deploy to wildfires for our own scientific interests. We want to collect data for a, a purpose or for a scientific study. Uh, so we kind of leverage both the needs of a fire management agency and, and the needs of what we're trying to do in our scientific program. So for many of you who don't know, I actually took a Dr. Kleiman's meteorology class in 2009, and he was an excellent professor. Oh, thank you. Yes, I remember Daphne in my class, and uh, she was the top student. So there you go. But uh, I was that was a lot that was long ago. I was I was much younger and more uh, more um, engaged, I guess. Now I don't teach as much because I'm more of a management and uh, director role, so I don't get into the general education classes as much as I would like to. However, San Jose State has developed, or I helped build this with my new faculty, uh, a new wildfire science minor degree. So. You know, we have a climate science general education class. Now we have a wildfire science class. It's called Introduction to, or it's called Wildfire and the Earth System. And it allows students in different majors, art, business, engineering, to take a science course and learn about wildfire and learn about fire behavior, fire weather, climate change, and all the impacts. And so um, it's getting popular because students are very interested in wildfire. And so uh, we're really excited to offer that to the community. At San Jose State. I'm sure that those are going to be very useful knowledge going forward. Yes, definitely. And it turns out there's lots of jobs with this uh, that are requiring this knowledge, particularly the insurance industry. They need people that are aware of wildfire risk and fire science. Uh, utilities hire fire meteorologists to help predict uh, wildfire risk. And a number of other companies are, are engaged in wildfire uh understanding risk and fire behavior um and particularly in silicon valley it's a it's a big thing because we are surrounded by the mountains and we have a lot of wildfire risk here so hiring people with wildfire knowledge is you know kind of way of the future so um we hope to fill those needs very unfortunate that california had to deal with the wildfire and those earthquakes yes both uh major disasters but you know, people love California for its weather and for its uh, geography, and the geography and ecosystems are shaped by fire. So because of climate change, the fires have gotten worse. So we can, you know, kind of fix our forests, fix our ecosystems with prescribed fire and better managing wildfire on the landscape. We'll be able to uh, get California back in shape so we can uh, enjoy it again. And people like dr warm, dry weather and warm, dry weather leads to dry fuels. So it's kind of one of those things that you like the weather, but that's fire weather. So hopefully we can uh, get uh, our forest in shape and um, really reduce the fire risk in our communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Clements, for your informative interview today. Thanks for having me, Daphne. It was great to see you. Thank you. Thank you.